you basically have control over things like the strength and the drag, and those two settings together will keep the friction. Now, if you've done cloth simulations, things can go a little bit crazy when you start moving around with like the settings of the drag. But all of the settings for how it reacts are on the actual cloth simulation tag. So things like wind drag and uh, strength and all those things, they'll give a different sort of look to the cloth when it gets you know, moving a little bit. So just going back to the example, that actually works. And uh, I'll show you some of the settings. So here we're kind of moving back and forth. So if I go back to that constraint tag, you can see like if you start changing the drag amount, it's still connected relatively to that point, but it's actually moving a little bit behind. And that's what that spring does. It sort of gives it that nice kind of buoyancy. So really cool. You know, the, I think the cloth tools inside of Cinema 4D, the kind of things that you can do with it, it's uh, really awesome. And just for people who are interested in exploring it a little bit more, the cloth collider tag, it works exactly how you would think. And you basically, like if I were to take just an object in here and uh, hit C, convert it, and do a cloth collider. Now if we play this back, you know, we're getting that interactivity. So Dragonfly is crashing into uh, mountains. You got it. It's all right here in Cinema 4D. Tell your friends. All right. Let's keep, let's keep this party going. So uh, the Dragonfly was a really fun challenge, but I think the bigger challenge was animating the camera through a lot of different space. So maybe before I talk about the camera, I can show you just like where the scene breaks are. And the reason why we had different scene breaks is for the dragonfly scene, for example, we did this with Octane, right? For that nice lush kind of greenery and that really nice translucency that you get with Octane. We built it, and, and i got to give a shout out to Aaron Westwood if he's watching. Uh, this guy is like a, a master of like nature scenes and Quixel, uh, really great stuff. And then we go underwater, and then we come up to a city scene, which is Cinema 4D with Redshift. So in order to get between those scenes, we, it's a natural place for a transition, and we go underwater, right? And then we have another really tricky thing happening here where the scene scale is a big city and then suddenly it's about four centimeters and then we're on another space and then of course we keep we keep going so let me just play this without the final comp and just look at the renders and show you the breaks and kind of see what we're working with So this was a really interesting one, right? Because you're going through the water. And if you're traveling, if the camera's moving through a plane of water, it has to be moving really, really slow. Like if, if the final transition has the edge of the water, maybe it's lasting seven or eight frames so that it feels fluid as it goes past the frame, the camera has to be moving extremely slow. But that means that you have to get the camera to that point. So as we pull out from the Dragonfly, you'll notice there's less stuff in the foreground that would parallax and that would cause the speed to appear to slow down so much. And then we drop down. Now, this part of the scene was done uh, using Element 3D and Comp in After Effects. And I can kind of show you what that looks like. So basically, we have the matte edge of the original scene. And we used Cineware to extract the camera and the knolls so that we had all of the data right inside of here that matched up perfectly. 
And it's basically two deformed planes that have this sort of water texture on it. And I can pull out here, let's see. I'll just throw a texture on here so you can see what we have. So you just have a cylinder just so that you could block out the back and so that you can have fog that kind of gets cut off into the back. And you'll notice the front is a little bit more deformed and the back is a little bit more flat. So we actually did that with Cinema 4D. We built a sort of a deformed plane, used a field to fade it out and so that we could have a nice clean plane. And then, of course, the secret. Well, two cool things, two cool things. So one is we actually, I guess in this version I didn't have it on, but one of the things that we can actually animate the cutoff of the plane. And so when you have like water drops and things that get really close to the camera, that's actually one trick for adjusting the speed of the dip, is if we change where the camera is cut off. So on this layer. It actually will change the sort of you know the perceived speed of the dip because it's now a little bit further away from the camera. So that was a cool way to be able to control how fast we want it to go down. And uh, of course, to make it look good, you just turn on some depth of field. Now, if we look at the comp, one one uh, other kind of thing to point out too is that the cameras do flow into each other, but what we realize is that it didn't exactly look great to, put it this way, when you watch animation, you can trick the speed of things, right? You can have things go a little bit faster and a little bit more whimsically and not feel like it's unrealistic. And so sometimes to have a smooth camera that is literally smooth, it doesn't work the same way. So if you can cheat the speed of the underground part. So to show you what I mean is, as you see this top layer, this is actually an additional layer of water that was created, an element, and there's just like a light here reflecting to match where the helicopter is. And you can see we actually overlaid it on top of the render of the city. Now, another good reason for this sort of setup is the city scene was massive, right? The, the geometry the textures, the details, all of the render settings made the scene render, you know, I don't know, 20 hours or something like that on a farm. And so if you have to keep tweaking the look of the city or the way that the comp works when we go underwater, that's going to be a lot of trial and error that you want to try to avoid. So that was definitely something that made a lot of sense for the comp. Let's take a look at one of these transitions. So this transition, we go from this sort of refracted water drop upside down. And uh, there's a lot of interesting layers to sort of blend this together. So this is the main render. And we actually brought in a version of the scene so that we could have another layer of refraction to composite over the water drop. Because we wanted there to be refraction on top of the image. So if you want something to look like it's inside the glass, you want to have reflection or refraction on the outside of it. And that gives, even though I couldn't find the HDR when I loaded up this project, you can just see a little bit of the refraction on the outside of the surface. It gives it a little bit of the glossiness. And then it sort of diffuses away as it goes. So here's kind of the basic setup. So we have the raw render here. And this was a good guide, right, to see the way that it works. And one other interesting thing is that when you're really close to something so small, the depth of field, can, you can actually see it on the water drop. Like a part of the water drop is out of focus. And that was a bit of a clue for the composite, because if we're going to add other elements into the shot, so this is a really cool effect. You guys use this effect called CC Lens in After Effects. It basically just creates like a distorted lens effect. And I mean, no joke, I just put it on there. I'm like, I'm a genius. This is the greatest effect I've ever used. It's funny when you find an effect that is exactly 
what you're trying to do. It's rare, but you must relish in it, my friends. This guy knows what I'm talking about. All right, so we're using, uh, we're using that same layer to mask it in, right? And then on top of that, we have the instance of the element with the refraction. So just to show you this, I've imported an actual C4D scene. So this is the scene of the dragonfly, and then we just extracted it with just a single water drop. Because this way, if we matched it up perfectly, then we would be able to do all the things that we'd want it to do. Like maybe we wanted to have some fog or do some other interactive things and have an actual 3D mat. It was really useful to have it there. So then on top of that, a really cool trick was putting this depth of field on top. So you can see it more in the beginning right here. And the inspiration for this was when you look at a refraction, your focal plane of like a camera, if you focus on the refraction of an optical source like a lens or something, you're actually focusing past the object that you're looking at. So the inspiration was, OK, well, if, we're, if we can see clearly the mountains, then the source of that, the sort of water surface, that shouldn't be in focus. And we'll slowly bring that into focus as we pull back and have it blend into the other water drops that are on the, uh, on the surface. Look at this. I'm, these are, this is a pretty heavy scene, and uh, I'm running it off a laptop. So this could be worse. But you can see the, you know, you're just trying to match, anytime you're doing compositing, you're just trying to match the blur and trying to get the feel to be pretty similar. Now, this actually reminds me of something is, you know, when you're creating reflections and things like that, I recently did a project where I tried to recreate a reflection source of a sky system. So this was the result. And this was an idea I had for the project, and we ultimately didn't end up needing it because the transition from the mountains was so fast we could just do a keyframe. But afterwards, I thought it would be fun to figure out how to create an actual sunrise system. So just to kind of sh show you the, the way this works is you have control over the haze, and you can change the position of the horizon. There's like little bits of clouds that are running across there. And then you have the opacity of the system. And then it blends in these star system. And uh, the stars are fading on based on uh, a spherical you know, equation that my programmer came up with that calculates the, ch ch you know, listen. Sergio, if you're watching, appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> Let's see if we can find that expression. It basically, I mean, if I know math, and I don't, it means the direction of the sun is the height of where the sun is in the scene. So basically, all we're doing is we're adjusting the height of the sun. And that's animating the time remap of this gradient system. So I just have an animated gradient. And then the position of the sun is fading that in and out. Uh, or moving that in and out through time. So a fun little thing that ended up nowhere, but I figured I would uh, sh show you the inspiration for that. Now, um, let's jump back really quick and talk about a couple of other sort of interesting challenges, right? So on this scene, we have to transition between the city scene and being inside of this orb, right? So anytime you are using physically-based renderers, you are dealing with real IOR refraction index. So on this orb, you can see, look at, look at the way that the side of the city gets distorted when we move through this. So here, let me turn that off. So in the, real render, in the real render, you can see that the city is kind of getting distorted and cut off. But in order to blend with the render that was separate, we had to make sure that they could blend perfectly together. So we tried a whole bunch of things. We tried animating the IOR. We tried uh, 
you know, doing the depth of field in posts, you know, that didn't really work. And ultimately what we did is we, re we rendered the scene two times, one with clear glass that you could see all the way through with no distortion, and another with the refraction. And the, uh, the solution was basically just to fade it in. So it's, it's kind of hard to see because there's some lens stuff on here, but basically there's a mask that just sort of shrinks down into the middle right here, and it goes from there to there. And you know, this is just one of those things where you just look at where the motion of the action is, right? And how can you just how can you match that motion so that you don't create something that is distracting or you know that it's all about sort of hiding the transitions. And then of course some uh, holograms. There's even some you know talking about dealing with problems that you haven't sort of figured out yet, right? So we have like this helicopter. We knew that this might be a problem, right? Because how fast should it be going? Is it going to be banking? Is the light and the volumetrics from the helicopter, is that going to create a problem that we're going to have to re-render things? And so we actually did that. I don't have a scene for that, but just to kind of tell you, that was created also an element along with some of these sort of futuristic city lighting textures. And this just saved us the trouble of trying to have two different lighting setups. So if you can imagine a helicopter out in the middle of a city, it's going to be really dark and not like a hero looking element that's backlit. And so by separating it, we could focus the lighting just on that element and make it pop out of the rest of the shot. And then technical things too. So we got to a point where we wanted to maybe put in some Easter eggs. And right here on this book is the uh, the musical arrangement for the deep note, which is this sort of inverse crescendo. And again, this is a pretty heavy scene to render, and so we, we just sort of created a book page. And actually, there was a technical reason for this, too, is because if you look at the actual render, the blur was so strong that you couldn't really see that Easter egg. I mean, that's a tough Easter egg to catch. You need to use some like AI de-blurring technology. Uh, so we not only did it as a separate pass, but we lowered the motion blur of that separate pass so that it would just read a little bit in that, in that moment. So listen, all those little things, they all add up. <laughs> um, we're pulling out through. Um, shout out to Orb for the uh, Earth in the background. Um, render that with, in After Effects, there's the VR tools that you can create a 360, and you can actually export that out. And then I loaded it into Redshift uh, on, the, on the light system. And that way, you can move it, and you actually get real light from the blue of that uh, planet. That planet. <laughs> and it you know, helps you mock up the framing. Because you know, when you're looking at the render, and you don't have a sense of scale and position, it's nice to have a little bit of something there. Um, now, one other kind of cool thing is um, we used, we're, we're developing this new tool called Nebula 3D, and it's sort of a volumetrics plugin for After Effects that works with your depth pass from your renderer. It can work in some other ways. But so we, let's just say that we beta tested it on this project, right? And here's sort of an example of how we used it. So in the base scene, we extracted the camera from Cinema 4D, brought the project in. And one of the things that we wanted to do was just create a little bit more clarity in some of the areas, like create a little bit more contrast. When, when you're having a camera that's moving really fast, you have to be thinking, how do you focus the audience attention on something? And the ways that you can do that is with lighting, with silhouette, contrast, and things like that. So, Using this Nebula plugin, uh, it basically works with the depth pass and allows you to move After Effects lights in and out of the depth. So as I move it through here, maybe I want to give a little bit more depth to this sort of gap in between these, or maybe this truss system needs just a little bit of backlighting. And that's basically how we use it. Because once we added the planet and the atmosphere in the background, it sort of became a little bit washed out, and we lost that separation. And just to point out a couple of other areas where 
that kind of came in handy was sort of the dragonfly coming off. You know, the legs are a bit dark against that area. And just by putting a little bit of haze back there, it just lets the dragonfly pop out a little bit more and, and makes you focus on it. Um, so if you guys want to see a little bit of a video on just some of the kind of cool things that you can do with it, this is the time where I kind of like plug my future stuff. But there's no release date yet, so it's just sort of showing off what we're working on and give you some ideas. Don't do your presentations in Premiere. So, some fun stuff. Oh, thanks. And if I could do a quick, let's see. So here's just like the idea. So what I'll do is I'll load a volume file. And this will sort of give you some insight. We created these spiral galaxy simulations, right, and brought in, created various resolutions of the VDBs. And if I create a light, get a bit of an idea on how this works. So we can control the density of the volumes, and we can add additional lighting, as I showed you in the bay example. Let's just try this. And let me just move this right into You can see I'm just changing the fall off settings. And then you can do things like have occlusion. So let's say we wanted just to put a 3D model occlusion. We could load a model or maybe just use a primitive occlusion. So here we just have a shape that's just creating a mask through that volume. And that way you can you know, blend it with a a different 3D object or a different scene, have it occlude with objects in your scene. And then we have things like object fields, which sort of work like Booleans for the volume. And what's cool about this is you have things like the fading control. So if you created a simulation, and let's say that simulation had, you know, you could see the, the emitter or something where that part kind of connected. Um, I wonder if I can load a volume sequence really quick. Let's see. So with this field on, you can see that it's sort of getting cropped into, into the space. And that's, again, it's the ability to have 3D cropping and occlusion so that you can put things exactly where you want to put them. And it works as a 3D object. So if you have a scene that has depth information like this bay, so we can look, you just have normal depth information. And this is actually a good tip. If you're using depth information, if you create Instead of just sort of saying, OK, that's enough depth to do the depth of field, I can probably you know, use that. If you actually set a real world value for that depth information, you can use After Effects camera distance, even without this plugin. And you can use the camera distance to perfectly occlude other objects using that depth pass. So I found that don't shortcut with the Z pass, because it's actually really nice to be able to know where that point is in 3D space. And, the more you know, synced up your compositing, 
and your cinema can be, the better you know, you'll be able to solve those like, weird problems. So uh, maybe one more thing to show you on this uh, as the last thing is we have a density remapping. So what this allows you to do is to remap color to the volume. So let's say we wanted to maybe put like some color into the volume. And then we have like controls for where that gets placed. And you know, just the more things that you can bring into your comp pipeline. Imagine you simulate one animated sequence. And you can reuse that. You can put one of them over here, rotate it, put one of them over here, rotate it, and it's all dynamic and live. And then when you have your volumetric light on, you can do actual occlusion. So if we turned on combined rendering mode, you can actually see that we're shadowing the light through the volume. And so we spent a lot of time just making it more like production ready and you know the, all of the problems and things that we ran into on the THX pro, uh, project we wanted to have depth we wanted to have oh the depth information that comes out of octane is different than the one out of redshift like we really worked hard to make it easy because you know the time schedule was so tight so just a little sneak peek at uh, what we're working on and uh, thank you guys so much uh, for stopping by I'm Andrew Kramer and we'll see you next time